The story feels solid because it's familiar. These islands are supposed to be ancient, fixed. Their peoples divided since deep time, English here, Irish there, Welsh and Scottish carved into the edges by history itself. That certainty is the first thing DNA strips away. Because beneath the story we repeat, the evidence keeps pointing to something else, something quieter, something far less comfortable. The land stayed, the names changed. The people did not remain what we imagine. That matters more than it sounds. DNA does not confirm inherited identities. It ignores them. And when it is read carefully, it exposes a contradiction most people never confront. The deepest genetic divide in Britain and Ireland is not medieval. It is not Roman. It is not even close. The most decisive transformation happened so early that almost every later story was built on top of it without noticing the ground had already shifted. Which means many identities we defend today are layered over something shared, something older, something that does not care about borders. If national history has ever felt confident but incomplete, that discomfort has a source. This is not a replacement myth. It is a dismantling. If you want archaeology and genetics explained without comfort or ceremony, subscribe to Stone and Bone. This channel exists for people who would rather lose certainty than protect it. Before these were nations, before they were islands, there was no separation at all. And that fact refuses to stay buried. 12,000 years ago, Britain and Ireland were not surrounded by water. A broad landscape stretched between them and mainland Europe. Forests, rivers, marshland. A living world now drowned beneath the North Sea. Doggerland is what we call it. For the people who crossed it, it was simply ground that connected everything. That connection mattered. These were the first permanent settlers of the region. Western hunter-gatherers. Small groups moving through familiar terrain, following animals, seasons, coastlines. Nothing separated them the way we separate people today. They shared land. They shared ancestry. They shared a future that had not yet split. Physically, they challenge modern assumptions. Ancient DNA and skeletal evidence suggest many had dark to black skin paired with light-colored eyes. Europe did not always look the way we expect it to. That detail matters because it breaks the illusion of permanence. For thousands of years, this population spread freely across what would later become England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. No borders, no nations, no inherited identities. Then, the ground began to change. Around 4000 BC, new groups arrived from the southeast. They brought farming, crops, domesticated animals, permanent homes, forests fell, fields replaced wildland. Populations expanded rapidly, this was not a takeover. It was an overlap. The new farmers mixed with the hunter-gatherers over generations. DNA blended. Lives merged. Older ancestry did not vanish. It persisted beneath the surface, quietly diluted but still present. For nearly two millennia, this mixed population dominated the region. And this is where the story becomes uncomfortable. England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland were still genetically unified long after we imagined division should have begun. Different landscapes, same deep ancestry. Which means, the idea that these peoples were always separate fails before history even starts. And then that unity shattered. Around 2400 BC, the shared genetic story broke. Not gradually. Not symbolically. Structurally. A new culture spread across Britain and Ireland with unnatural speed. Bell-shaped pottery appeared in graves. Metal replaced stone. Status began to matter even in death. These people carried ancestry tied to the Eurasian steppe, descendants of pastoral groups who had already reshaped much of Europe. They arrived with bronze technology, new social rules, and a genetic force the land could not absorb evenly. This is where archaeology falls quiet, and DNA speaks clearly. Ancient genomes show that within a few centuries, most earlier male lineages collapsed. Thousands of years of continuity narrowed to a handful of surviving lines. One paternal branch rose sharply above the rest. That did not happen by chance. In parts of Britain, especially the East, the turnover was extreme. So extreme that most earlier ancestry became secondary within just a few generations. The people who built monuments like Stonehenge did not remain the primary ancestors of those who lived among them. That realization should not feel abstract. 
because it means disappearance does not require extinction. It only requires being outnumbered long enough. But this did not happen everywhere. In the West, in harsher terrain and fractured landscapes, older ancestry survived in higher proportions. Change slowed. Mixing replaced replacement. The outcome was uneven and permanent. What followed was not erasure. It was overriding. Layer placed over layer, without removing what came before. This moment matters more than Rome, more than Anglo-Saxons, more than Vikings. It reset the genetic foundation of the islands, and it quietly decided who would absorb future change and who would resist it. If that destabilizes the story you grew up with, it should. Because this is the part almost no one tells you. And nothing that comes after makes sense without it. Before the differences between these nations make sense, one assumption has to be dismantled. Most people think DNA works like a label, a marker you inherit that explains who you are. Words like R, 1B, or I, 2 get treated as identities, as if a single code can stand in for an entire past. That belief is convenient and wrong. A haplogroup follows one ancestral line, one thread pulled from a fabric woven from thousands of people. It feels definitive because it is simple. That simplicity hides almost everything that matters. Autosomal DNA tells the fuller story. It carries the combined inheritance of all your ancestors, every mixture, every overlap, every compromise repeated over generations. This is where population structure actually appears. And what it shows is unsettling. When scientists map autosomal DNA across Britain and Ireland, they do not see nations. They see gradients, soft edges, clusters shaped by mountains, coastlines, and isolation rather than borders. In some cases, neighboring valleys differ more genetically than entire countries. That is not a technical detail. It means identity forms where movement stops, and difference forms where geography interferes. Once that clicks, the later history of these islands stops looking accidental. It starts looking inevitable. Wales did not preserve older ancestry because it resisted change. It preserved it because change struggled to pass through. This land folds inward, mountains rise quickly, valleys narrow, movement slows. For migrating populations, Wales was not a corridor. It was a barrier that filtered who stayed and who moved on. That filter left a mark. When Roman power spread across Britain, it settled the lowlands and avoided the high ground. When later migrations arrived from the east, they followed the same logic. Roads, farms, and towns filled the plains. The earlier Britannic populations did not disappear. They withdrew. Over generations, pressure pushed people west into terrain where survival favored continuity over expansion. In doing so, they carried older ancestry with them, not untouched, but less overwritten. That distinction matters. Modern Welsh populations cluster distinctly from most of England. Not because Wales escaped history, but because fewer large-scale migrations passed through it. The Bronze Age genetic foundation remained clearer here than almost anywhere else in Britain. This does not make Wales older, or purer, or separate. It makes it less erased. And that difference still shapes how ancestry looks today. If you've noticed unusually strong continuity tied to Western Britain in DNA results, this geography is the reason. If that matches what you've seen, say so in the comments. Patterns this consistent are never coincidence. Ireland followed a similar path, but with one critical difference. It was never absorbed into the Roman world. No legions stationed for centuries, no imperial road network, no long-term administrative presence reshaping daily life. That absence removed a layer before it could ever form. As a result, Ireland developed along its own trajectory, a distinct Gaelic culture, a language that evolved without imperial pressure. In rural regions, especially along the western seaboard, genetic continuity runs unusually deep, in some places, uncomfortably deep. Bronze Age ancestry remained dominant, particularly along male lines. Autosomal DNA shows long-term stability that rivals any region in northwestern Europe. Not frozen, but less disrupted. That stability did not mean isolation. In the late 8th century, Long ships appeared on the horizon. Vikings arrived first as raiders, then as settlers. And unlike in many other regions, they built something permanent. Cities. Dublin, Waterford, Limerick, Wexford, Cork. These were not ancient Gaelic foundations. 
They were Norse implants placed directly into the coastline. Their genetic impact was sharp but uneven, strong in ports, weak inland, often male biased, leaving a signature of integration rather than replacement. Ireland became layered in a different way. An ancient Atlantic core surrounded by urban fractures shaped by outsiders. If Scandinavian traces appear in Irish DNA results, especially tied to coastal ancestry, this is where they enter the record. If you are starting to recognize these fault lines in your own background, drop a comment. This is where personal history and population history quietly intersect. Scotland is often imagined as untouched, remote, preserved by distance. Genetically, that image collapses fast. Northern Britain did not experience the same Late Bronze Age and Iron Age reshaping that transformed the South. While populations reorganized elsewhere, the North retained a structure that was already old by the time Rome appeared. That alone creates tension. When Roman forces pushed north, they encountered people they struggled to classify. Caledonians, later called the Picts. They left stones, symbols, and almost no written records. But DNA fills that silence. Genetically, these were not outsiders. They were continuity, long-standing Iron Age populations who never fully absorbed the migrations that reshaped southern Britain. Then the pressure changed direction. Across the Western Sea came Gaelic-speaking groups from Ireland. Not a single invasion, a slow transfer of people, language, and power. Over time, Gaelic identity overtook Pictish identity without erasing the people themselves. That matters, because it shows how identity can disappear while ancestry remains. Then the North opened again. Norwegian Vikings arrived with a different intensity than anywhere else in Britain. In Orkney and Shetland, settlement was not temporary. It was foundational. Even today, Scandinavian ancestry is impossible to miss. Scotland did not form through preservation. It formed through collision. Indigenous northern populations. Irish Gaels. Norse settlers. Pressed together by geography and movement, not by choice. If Scottish identity feels layered or contradictory, that isn't confusion. It's the residue of pressure. If you're from Scotland, which part of this story do you hear about most in your own family history? If Wales filtered history and Ireland buffered it, England absorbed it. This landscape faces the continent without resistance, broad plains, navigable rivers, short sea crossings. For thousands of years, England was the easiest way in. And once people arrived, they stayed. Rome ruled Britain for nearly four centuries. Roads cut through the land, cities grew, administration reshaped daily life. And yet, genetically, the Roman imprint is surprisingly light. Power does not guarantee replacement. Rome governed England. It did not repopulate it. The real demographic shift came after Rome withdrew. In the 5th century, Angles, Saxons, and Jutes crossed the North Sea. They did not arrive as a thin ruling class. In parts of eastern and southern England, they arrived in numbers large enough to permanently reshape ancestry. But not everywhere. Some regions absorbed heavy continental input. Others retained far more of their older Britannic ancestry. The result was not replacement. It was accumulation. Later came Danish Vikings, concentrated heavily in the east and north. Then Norman elites, who reshaped power structures while barely touching the gene pool. England became a genetic archive of repeated contact. Layer added to layer. No clean breaks. No single origin story. Which is why English DNA collapses under scrutiny. If you're English, your region tells you more than the label ever will. If you're willing to share, say where your family comes from. The differences exist because England never learned how to close itself. This is where certainty finally breaks. We expect language and ancestry to align. Celtic language means Celtic DNA. Germanic language means Germanic ancestry. The logic feels obvious. It is also wrong. Language spreads through power, trade, and prestige. DNA spreads through proximity and time. Wales retained a Celtic language because geography protected culture, not because ancestry stood still. England adopted a Germanic language, while much of its population remained biologically continuous. Scotland speaks English today despite deep Pictish, Gaelic, and Norse ancestry. This pattern is not unique. Latin reshaped Iberia without replacing its people. 
Arabic spread across North Africa, while older ancestry persisted. Turkish became dominant in Anatolia, while most DNA remained local. Language remembers authority. DNA remembers contact. When people call themselves Celtic or Anglo-Saxon, they are often naming history, not inheritance. Genetics does not validate identity. It destabilizes it. And that is why DNA feels threatening rather than reassuring. On the surface, these islands appear divided. Four nations, four identities, four histories taught as separate from the beginning. Beneath the surface, the genetic record refuses that simplicity. It shows shared origins, uneven transformation, geography deciding who absorbed change and who resisted it longest. Mountains slowed movement, seas concentrated settlement, open land invited newcomers, isolation preserved memory. These nations were not born. They were worn into existence, layer by layer, migration by migration, generation by generation. We are not the descendants of a single people. We are the outcome of repeated contact, retreat, and survival. If this changed how you think about your own ancestry, say which part unsettled you most. Discomfort is often where understanding begins. And if you want more stories where archaeology, genetics, and history are allowed to collide without softening the impact, subscribe to Stone and Bone. The past isn't gone. It's still inside us, whether we're comfortable with it or not.